everyone, this is Jess Roman, and I'd like to welcome you to the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium, May 2021 edition. We're really happy to have so many of you with us here today. Um, I'd like to present our guest today, Eleanor Murray, whichever way you're seeing her on your screen, I'll introduce her in just a minute. But since we do have a lot of new attendees today, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about our colloquium series. We're doing this on the first Wednesday of every month. The BEMC is organized by Toivo Glatz, Tobias Kurt, and myself, as well as uh, with some help from Chisato Ito and Hannah Grillmeyer. We're very grateful for their support in the organization. I'd also like to introduce some of our panelists today. We have started since the last session uh, a new trend of inviting a few folks to yeah, help us out with the discussion, keep things a bit more lively, also to allow you to have some other faces on the screen. So today we have Felicitas Kuhne, we have Uwe, Uwe Siebert, Jennifer Haas with us as well, and we may have one additional panelist joining us later. They can introduce themselves then in the discussion section at the end of the talk. Um, if you'd like to join us next month, we are doing this again on June 2nd, 4 p.m. Berlin time or whatever time it is, wherever you're tuning in from. And we'll be having Zabina Gabrisch presenting a cluster randomized controlled field trial in practice. So we're looking forward to that next time. I also just wanted to mention that we do have a sort of informal get together on this platform called Wonder immediately following the discussion after the talk today. So if you want to get to know other epidemiologi epidemiologizers, I don't know where I was going with that, epidemiologists uh, and folks interested in methods, please stick around and join us on Wonder as well. Okay, um, I think that's enough of the blah blah introduction. So we'll get to the good stuff, what you're all here for today. We are so honored and uh, happy to have Ellie Murray with us. Ellie is an assistant professor of epidemiology at the Boston University School of Public Health in the US. She runs a causal lab, I believe it's called there. And she does a lot of things. Many of you may know Ellie from her presence on Twitter. She's very, very active, especially in COVID-19 related communication. She has a great initiative called the Epi COVID Core. Um, you can check her out on Twitter at Epi Ellie. We'll put that in the chat. She also co-hosts a podcast called Casual Inference, talking about some of the topics like what we're, we're talking about here today. And just a little bit of her background, since it's always interesting for us to see how people um, get to work in the field. She has a background initially in biology and then got a master's in public health from Columbia, uh, followed by a PsyD in Epi and a master's of science in biostatistics from Harvard before making it to BU. Okay, I think that's it. And I'll turn it over to Ellie to introduce you to her talk and kick things off. And if you have any questions today, please put them in the Q&A. Use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can contribute to the lively discussion. If you would like to ask your own question, we can unmute you. That's also kind of fun. So just indicate that in the Q&A, um, make a note that you'd like to ask it on air and then we will um, call on you. Okay, I hope I didn't forget anything other folks. Otherwise, we'll turn it over to Ellie. Thanks a lot for being here. Great. Thanks so much for having me and thanks so much for the invitation. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how to deal with treatment confounder feedback, um, the circle of life that we encounter uh, very frequently in epidemiology and which is not uh, well handled by some of the more traditional methods that people are used to using. So, um, you know, I'm sure everybody on this call knows that it's really complicated to try to untangle what's going on with epidemiology. And so the scenario that we're I'm really gonna focus on here is one where treatment is given over time in multiple time points. So almost every treatment people take has this, has this feature. Um, also many exposures that are not medical treatments, but environmental exposures or things like that. Um, so the treatment is happening over time and the treatment is both a cause of and a consequence of the same confounder over 
time. So the confounders can also change over time and we have this feedback cycle. So in this graphic here, you know, we see a sort of classic feedback loop, but this is not how things really happen in the world. So feedback loops do exist. We have lots of variables that have this feedback property, but they're not really loops. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. <laughs> um, instead, we need to think about these loops as recurring, a recurring sequence over time. So we might have, you know, here I've added in a clear baseline of like randomization, but there might be a confounder. Can you see my, my mouse? Okay. Um, there might be a confounder at baseline, which potentially could determine treatment at baseline or not, um, but is certainly going to determine how that confounder changes over follow-up. Treatment itself can affect the value of that confounder. Often in a medical setting or a clinical epi setting, treatment, um, the confounder is some kind of biomarker that's affected by the treatment, some symptom, something like that. Um, let me get a bigger pointer here, spotlight, okay. Um, yeah, so we have the confounder at baseline and the confounder over follow-up. And then the treatment is going to affect that confounder and that confounder will affect future treatment decisions. So if the biomarker indicates that a person is getting better, they may be taken off treatment or treatment may be reduced. If the biomarker indicates that the treatment is not being successful, they may be switched to another treatment, they may have their treatment increased. And various different decisions are gonna be made over time that link the treatment and the confounder in this really complicated feedback way. And then, you know, the confounder could be a marker for health status as well. It could have other independent effects on health status and lots of, especially the biomarkers that we're interested in have many different consequences. And so it's likely that they affect not only treatment decision, but also the outcome of uh, or health status over time. And if the confounder is symptoms, then that may even, confounder may even actually be the outcome that people are interested in at the end of follow-up. So one of the really big challenges with these feedback cycles is sometimes deciding where in the loop are we gonna start with our question. So can be kind of a chicken and an egg scenario. If we're interested in untangling um, a relationship between um, PTSD and depression and trauma and substance use and that, that impact on suicide, we need to think about where in the pipeline we might start our study, where are we gonna focus on um, to, to deal with that? that feedback loop? Are we interested on in the treatment part? Are we interested on in obstetrium trauma part? Um, you know, if PT, PTSD and depression are different pieces, which one of those are we interested in thinking of as the cause and which one as the confounder? And we can end up in some really complicated kind of chicken and egg problems here, especially when we're thinking about exposures that really happen over the lifespan. Um, and especially when we're thinking about things that don't necessarily have a clear start and stop. So um, nutrition exposures are definitely something that fall into this category where you know somebody is gonna have a nutritional exposure for probably most of their life and deciding when is the place that we wanna start asking our question from, um, where are we gonna break that loop open and start this linear um, sequence of events is really a complicated thing to think through. And so um, this is also the case when we have even just a single time point of intervention, but with multiple components that we might be interested in. So we could imagine a randomized trial where we would still have this problem potentially, where we randomize individuals to a combined diet and exercise intervention. Um, and this is an example that was based on an, an actual trial where participants were randomized to an assigned diet and exercise intervention. The goal was that they lose weight. And then at the end of the trial, all of the news reports and, and promotion of this trial was about how well the assigned diet worked. But you really can't disentangle if you have this combined intervention. 
um, because the diet and the exercise are in this kind of feedback loop themselves and both pieces have an impact on BMI. So this kind of problem can be a problem even when we feel like we can actually get an estimate of a causal effect, like in a randomized trial, we can still have a problem of not being able to untangle the parts of the intervention. So, you know, the relative contribution of say diet or exercise, not being able to untangle the timing of the intervention or whether we can discard certain pieces. And it can also be important, um, have important consequences for understanding transportability, which is how well would our intervention work in a different group, um, either with a different comparator or in a different population. And so that, that feedback loop can cause problems, you know, even just sort of in understanding conceptually um, things that we maybe think of as more simple study designs like randomized trials. Um, so this is uh, one of the reasons why we really need to think carefully about how we define our causal questions. And so I know um, there's often a lot of back and forth in uh, the epi literature about whether we really need well-defined interventions. So I like to always give a plug for my perspective on why we need well-defined interventions or well-defined causal questions. And so there's really two components to this. The first is that, um, if we have an exposure that we're interested in, that's something say like a biomarker that we can't necessarily intervene on directly. So we can imagine that this little guy here has high cholesterol and we're interested in knowing what the impact of this little dude's high cholesterol is on some um, health outcome. And so if we were just going to compare high cholesterol versus low cholesterol, what we'd really be comparing is the impact of all of the different ways in which a person like our individual here could get high cholesterol. So maybe this little dude's high cholesterol is because of his diet. Maybe it's because of some medications he's taking. Maybe it's because of genetics. Um, there are a whole bunch of different possible reasons why this individual has high cholesterol. And if we just take a sample and we compare the individuals with high cholesterol and the individuals with low cholesterol, without really considering what intervention we want to specify, then we're really taking a weighted average of all possible interventions on all causes of high cholesterol. And the weights are the distribution of those causes in the population that we have or in the sample that we have. And that's really, really difficult to unpack because um, you know, this little individual may have diet and medication issues and we don't know which one of those actually led to this individual's high cholesterol. Um, so even if we can look at, even, even if we can identify these, these causes of the biomarker and identify the distribution of those causes, those aren't necessarily actually the weights that we're thinking about in this weighted average. So, you know, we could get an answer here, but it can be really complicated to interpret and it can be really hard to think about it in a different population. And so, um, you know, but this is one way of kind of interpreting those kinds of questions. And I, I should have put it here, but um, there's a nice paper by um, Paloma, uh, blanking on her last name, um, that, that interprets um, high blood pressure as an exposure in this kind of consideration of it being a weighted causal, a weighted average causal effect. Um, so this is, you know, an interpretation issue if we don't specify which particular intervention we're interested in changing, whether we're interested in changing diet in some way, whether we're interested in changing high cholesterol through a medical intervention, um, through some kind of genetic intervention. But another problem is that if we don't know what all of those possible ways an individual can get high cholesterol is, um, and so that our intervention is ill-defined, it's really, really hard to trust that our confounding structure is also um, is well-defined. And so it's very likely that we have ill-defined confounding structures if we have an ill-defined intervention, because the confounders now need to take into account all of those ways that a person can get high blood pressure and potentially things that are confounders for those and the outcome. So, um, if there are components of the diet that 
uh, are causes of high blood pressure. Some of those components may be confounders, but maybe some of the more upstream things um, that lead to that diet could also be confounders. And so this is something that gets a lot more complicated when we don't have a well-defined causal question or well-defined intervention. Um, so the well-defined intervention concept is, is really important even when we have a single time point, a single point exposure, but it gets a lot, a lot more important when we start having questions that occur for exposures or treatments over time, because now we really want to think about what is the sequence of exposure or treatment histories over time that we're interested in for the different comparison groups. Are we interested in you know, always take treatment or never take treatment? Are we interested in um, start now or start later? And if so, um, if, if it's start later, what is the trigger for that? And do we need to think about confounders for that trigger? And so we can get into like some really complex questions um, with time varying treatments or exposures, but we need, so that's why you know, we really need to think about specifying them well. So some of the sort of tips I have for asking good questions or good causal questions when we have complex exposures, which include um, exposures with multiple time points or exposures with multiple components that are kind of interrelated. Um, so the first thing is to think about, you know, what intervention would you do if you could do an experiment, even if that experiment isn't something that's real world feasible. So this is, I think, sort of the typical question people think about with well-defined interventions. So, you know, maybe you can't actually modify somebody's cholesterol level, but if you were, you know, given a uh, you know, mad scientist powers, you would like to modify it by forcing people to change their diet in a certain way, or you would like to modify it by intervening on their genetics. Um, in that case, that's the exposure that you're really interested in. Then another thing that's important to consider is what time points you would do the intervention at, especially when we have these more uh, life course type exposures. So, you know, if you're thinking about, uh, you know, how many French fries should you eat? And it, it maybe is important question whether you're interested in how many french fries children should be eating or how many french fries adults should be eating and thinking about whether you're interested in, say, an, in, an experiment that would ask, you know, 30 year olds to change their french fry eating habits, or if you're interested in something that's more like an entire lifetime of eating in this way. The next question that it's helpful to think about is if you had that experiment, what treatment policy or other decision would the experiment provide evidence to help you make? So um, a lot of times when we start thinking about this, we actually realize, you know, we don't necessarily have a particular decision that we're trying to inform. And we're really just trying to get a better sense of what's going on with the variables. And in which case, we may not actually be ready to ask a causal effect type question at all. So if we're just really trying to understand who is, you know, the most impacted so that we can study that group and understand why, then maybe what we want to do is more sort of detailed descriptive work. Um, but if we're thinking about, well, you know, uh, clinicians, deal with patients coming into their office who are experiencing new onset pain and they need to make a treatment decision. Or they have, maybe we're interested in patients who have failed on another treatment and are now looking for an alternative. And thinking about that will really help you figure out how to ask the question that's relevant. Um, so an example of a study where we're really thinking hard about this. Um, I'm working with a group at BU on the Presto study um, where they did a, a sub-study randomizing some individuals to the use of fertility tracking apps. And so in this app is something that you would have to use over a long period of time. And so, you know, the intention to treat effect is, is simple. People were invited to sign up for this app or not. But thinking about you know, more complex causal effects of a sort of per protocol nature is really comes down to thinking about, well, in that setting of a you know, OB-GYN office, if a woman comes in and you know, is having some problems conceiving, 
what kind of scenario would we want to recommend a fertility treatment app in and what kind of duration would we want to recommend that a woman try it for and so you know do we need to think about continuous use for six months or can we think about you know cycle by cycle use and just looking like within each cycle or pooled across all cycles in the study of how successful it is on an average for um, a cycle so thinking about that that clinical decision or that clinical conversation can really help inform um, what kind of question we want to ask there and then um, the last piece that's really important is to think about what you or a clinician or whoever it is that's making that decision, what they know at the time that the decision um, is going to be made or at the time that the decision was made in the past. And this is, I think, really important for untangling whether you're asking a, type, a prediction type question, whether you're asking a causal effect type question, and what kinds of information you can include in your um, specification of your intervention. So um, an example of this, um, one of the, the other projects I'm working on is a trial looking at long-term outcomes of meniscal tear treatment options for people with osteoarthritis. Um, so that's the knee injuries. And so thinking about, you know, the, there was an original five-year trial period, and then now we're looking at a long-term follow-up and thinking about what kinds of questions do we want to ask? Some of those are questions at baseline where at that time, none of the follow-up information is available. And so we can't count into the treatment decisions or the types of questions we want to ask. But another time point might be five years after an initial injury, what kinds of decisions would we like to make then? And those decisions could be informed by the first five years of data collection, um, but should not be informed by anything that happens after that. And so. Um, this is something that often prediction models can get a little bit um, confused on where a lot of times a prediction model will be designed with all available data and some of that is data that hasn't happened yet when you're making a the actual decision in clinical practice or, or in practice and that can be um, a little bit complicated then for actually implementing. So thinking about what information is typically available in those settings is important for helping um, ask a good question. Okay, so that's sort of how we might think about asking our questions. Now I want to talk a little bit about how we go about solving the problem of answering those questions. Um, and so if we have a randomized trial, that's a great option, but a lot of times we don't. And so the next best thing is to kind of think about emulating that trial with observational data. Some of the key problems for observational data, as I'm sure you all are aware of, are who we should include in the observational data. Um, this is particularly challenging when we're interested in comparing an exposure or a treatment to nothing or emulating a sort of placebo controlled trial, because it can be really hard to decide who somebody that's not exposed is in our data set and whether that means someone who's never exposed, which would be using future information, or just someone who's not exposed right now, um, but may become exposed in the future. Another really big challenge for observational data is about when baseline starts. So in a randomized trial, it can be really clear. Baseline is at randomization um, or baseline is at the first you know, treatment uh, point where the treatment might be offered in some cases. But in observational data, especially when we're thinking about you know, existing observational data sources, when baseline starts is, is really tricky. And again, this is one that's particularly hard if we're thinking about you know, the never treated group or the treat, treat later group. Um, when does never start is, is a really challenging question to answer. And um, so I'm not gonna really go too much into specific solutions just for those, but there's a lot of cases where observational studies kind of across the board have gotten the wrong um, conclusion. And when we just reevaluate those two pieces in terms of who is actually included and when does baseline start, we end up resolving all of the differences between the observational data and the randomized trial data. So those two pieces are really big parts of the puzzle that we really need to think about carefully. 
Um, and then the third big challenge is why exposure happened or didn't happen to the people in our study. And that's kind of the issue of confounding. Um, in the trial, largely exposure happened because we told people to have the exposure. Um, but in observational data, obviously, there are other things going on. So um, the solution to kind of all of these problems in general is um, or one solution is a target trial concept with uh, G methods as the analytic approach. So the target trial concept is basically a formalization of thinking about what is that trial you would like to do um, and how would, you, how would you do it and how would you have to change that trial based on the data that you have available or based on data that you could get access to. And so um, if if I'm designing a target trial, I really start by a full specification of what are the inclusion exclusion criteria in the trial that I would like to do, when would start a follow up and end of follow up be in that trial. Um, what types of analytic approaches would I use what types of outcomes would I measure in that trial in an ideal situation and then thinking about how does that start to have to change based on various different complications with observational data um, until we kind of get to the best we can do with the data we have. And sometimes, you know, the best we can do with the data we have is not great, but going through this process can really help you think about where are the different places that bias can creep in. So sometimes with the observational data, we know from the beginning, well, we're never going to be able to deal with this particular confounder that's missing. But going through that concept and, uh, you know, through this approach and thinking about that, we can get to a clear understanding then, okay, we know we have this big confounder that's missing. Now maybe we can do some kind of quantitative bias analysis to see what is the maximum impact a confounder of that sort of type could have um, under some assumptions about what type of strength of confounding that variable causes. Um, and then we can use the G methods to deal with the fact that we have this treatment confounder feedback issue. So um, I'm next going to give a sort of quick handshake introduction to the G methods. So um, there's really four methods in, in this. I always forget number three, doubly robust, because it's kind of a combination of the other ones. Um, but so we have inverse probability weighting of marginal structural models, often called IPW, or it might be called IPTW for inverse probability of treatment weighting, or IPCW for inverse probability of censoring weighting. Um, we have the G formula, which often is implemented in the parametric G formula, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit. Um, doubly robust methods kind of combine those. So the inverse probability weighting approach is really useful when we want to, or when we feel like we've got a really good handle on the causes of treatment um, or those confounders that are causes of treatment. If we feel like we can model that part of the distribution best, then IPW is a good solution. The G formula requires modeling the distribution of the confounders and the relationship between the confounders and the outcome. And so if we've got a better handle on that aspect of the causal graph, then the G formula is a good solution. Um, doubly robust actually kind of combines that and says, well, we'll model all of the different parts of the distribution. And if we get at least one part right, our answer should be right. And so then um, that has been extended in some cases to things like targeted maximum likelihood estimation if, if you're using machine learning. Um, and then lastly is G estimation of structural nested models. And um, as far as I can tell, this method is still pretty much theoretical. I did a few years back a survey to try, a, you know, a review to try to see how many implementations of this there had actually been. <laughs> it was like four and all by Jamie. So um, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but it is an option that exists. It's, and it's um, good to kind of know that it's <laughs> anyway, so the G methods, um, really, the G in G methods is really for general or generalized. And so the G methods generalize estimation to treatment confounder feedback settings. So um, they take the types of things that we might be able to do in a normal point exposure, um, single time point of exposure setting and apply those to settings where we have this feedback loop. And so because of that, we can kind of think of analogies between the G methods and some of the more classic methods that we're used to. So um, it, the 
the G methods here that we would use if we have treatment confounder feedback are sort of roughly similar to these other methods um, with some differences. So if you would normally use pro propensity scores in your single time point setting, then you might think about using inverse probability weighting in your treatment confounder setting. If you would normally use standardization, um, you know, as a standard SMR, SRR, then you might want to think about using the G formula. Um, and if you would normally use instrumental variables, you might want to think about using G estimation. Um, you can also use the G methods in the point exposure setting. And so you could just always use the G methods, but uh, a lot of people are more, more comfortable with some of these more, more traditional methods. So this is kind of a way to think about it. And then doubly robust is not on this list because there's not necessarily a clear um, analog, but um, it sort of matches up with the propensity score standardization type setting. Um, so I want to kind of go a little bit through what these methods look like, um, starting with inverse probability weights. So inverse probability weighting is, you can kind of think about it as a way of correcting for missing information. So we can correct for loss to follow up. I, that is the outcome is missing. Um, for some groups, um, we can correct for non-adherence or, or not following a, a treatment strategy that we're interested in. And we can think about that as missing, correcting for missing counterfactual outcome information. Um, and, but we can also correct for other types of missingness. So um, for example, I often use this if I have individuals who are intermittently missing visits, then I might um, have weights for attending a visit and then additional weights for a particular treatment if they conditional on having attended that visit. Um, and so we can basically make weights for all of these different types of things and then multiply all the weights together and have a single weight that we use to correct for all the different types of missing information in our data set. Um, at a single time point, inverse probability weighting is uh, we can think of, so these are censoring weights here. So one over the probability of being uncensored, conditional on some baseline characteristics. And a stabilized weight might additionally add in, here instead is randomization, um, might additionally add in a numerator that's just the sort of overall distribution of being uncensored. So when we're thinking about sen censoring weights, um, we always want the probability of being uncensored here. When we're thinking about treatment weights, um, instead of C equals zero, which is the probability of being uncensored, we would have the probability of receiving the treatment that you actually received. Um, and so thinking about our DAG, we can think about the weights as removing the arrow from say Z into censoring, as well as moving the arrow from L into censoring. And then we'll think about the stabilized weights um, if we have the baseline, the probability of being uncensored conditional on Z in the numerator, that actually kind of adds back in that arrow. So a stabilized censoring weight population would be one that has um, censoring in the randomization groups that's still happening at the level of censoring in the trial, but is not um, associated with the confounder any longer. So random as far as the confounder is concerned. If we want to think about multiple time points, we just do that, but more. <laughs> so um, for each time point, we would have a probability of being uncensored at that time point, conditional on, you know, maybe Z for if we have a randomized trial, um, conditional on the history of confounders, and conditional on having remained uncensored up to the previous time point. And then we just multiply those together across all of the time points um, to get a time point specific weight. And then if we want to stabilize, we can stabilize again for probability remaining uncensored at each time. But for stabilized weights, we only want those to be conditional on something that happens at baseline. So it could be just randomization. It could be randomization and baseline covariates. Um, and again, we get the product of these across the whole time point. And so at each time point, a person receives a weight that's inversely, inversely proportional to the probability of remaining uncensored up to that time point, conditional on 
their baseline characteristics and their time varying covariate histories. Again, if this was treatment weights, instead of C equal, CJ equals zero or CJ minus one equals zero, we would have some um, particular level of exposure at time J and particular history of exposure up to time J. So we can uh, again think about the fact that in the um, unstabilized weights, by including Z and L history in the condition of that probability, we're removing those arrows into censoring from the baseline covariates and from the time varying covariates. And if we're, so, so our non-stabilized weights are creating a pseudo population that has no censoring or no, no selection at all. Um, but in our stabilized weights, we're then adding back in the baseline to censoring arrow. Um, and so in this, we have a pseudopopulation that does have some selection, but does not have selection bias, uh, assuming that we got all of the right confounders and we don't have any confounders anymore. I'm going to skip this, but I'll send the slides to Jessica and you can look at this if you want. Um, okay, uh, G formula time. So the G formula is a generalization of standardization to time varying settings. The formula part, this is the G formula is an equation that relates observational data to the counterfactual data. And then there are many different ways of solving this equation, but the G formula itself is that specific equation. Um, so a lot of times this is going to be solved using Monte Carlo simulation, um, which relies on some parametric modeling assumptions. And uh, as Uwe uh, reminded me, today is like the 19th anniversary of his first, the first implementation of that in an applied data set, which uh, maybe we can talk about uh, on the panel section. Um, so I just want to really quickly show the G formula formula. So again, for a single time point of exposure, uh, the G formula on the one hand, one side of the equation is the counterfactual outcome probability if everyone had some exposure level A. Um, so here, this is the probability of counterfactual probability of, of a specific outcome, but it could also be an expected value of a continuous outcome. On the other side of the equation, we have the conditional probability of the outcome, the observed outcome within levels of the exposure and the confounder, and in particular, when the ex for those people whom the exposure is equal to little a. So this is a stratum specific observed outcome probability. We have the probability of being in each stratum of covariates. We multiply those together for each strategy and then stratum, and then we sum across all of the strata. Um, so we can do then the analogous thing for the for mul multiple time points of exposure. It looks a lot nastier, but it basically still has the same components. So um, the the outcome is still the counterfactual under some strategy. Um, and then now we still have the observed outcome distribution given now instead of just covariate strata, a, his, a history of covariate strata, strata. So a joint covariate and exposure history and you know maybe not having died yet, for example, um, could be an important covariate in this model. So, but we still have this stratum specific outcome um, probability, and then we still have a distribution of the covariates. In this example, we also have in the middle here, just the probability of still being alive up to each time points because the outcome here is death and you can only experience death if you haven't yet died. Um, but otherwise the components are basically still the same. Um, there are a number of different ways of solving the G formula for a very small number of covariates and, and particularly non-continuous covariates and time points, we can calculate it by hand, um, but that very quickly becomes uh, intractable. And so we have a couple of other options. So we can use Monte Carlo simulation and there are some um, packages. There's a SAS macro and an R package that you can get um, at this uh, GitHub um, from the Harvard causal group. And um, there's also an iterative approach we can use. This is a sort of 
uh, approach that hasn't really been described too much in the literature, but there's a nice paper from Len Wen um, last year in biometrics that kind of describes how the iterative approach works and when it does and doesn't compare favorably with the Monte Carlo approach. And this basically just allows you to make some different types of modeling assumptions. Um, so both uh, the G methods and the standard approaches can control for confounding by these time varying covariates. But the problem that the G methods really solve is that the standard methods can open up the possibility of collider bias because they fail to consider that the, the confounder is also an intermediate for prior exposure. And so um, that's the real kind of problem here that we're trying to solve with all of these methods. Um, I have kind of a worked example that shows a Helen calculation of the G formula IPW and an approach that naively just ignores the um, intermediate confounder. I'm not going to go through those, but I said I'll share these slides with Jess and that way you can kind of look through them at, at, on your own time. Um, but this is an example where if you calculate it, you get the right answer with IPW in the G formula and the wrong answer with just using a sort of stratum uh, specific method. So you can kind of get a sense for how that works. Um, so I think um, I'm going to open it up now to the panel discussion. Um, and uh, my little uh, Lion King graphic that you have a treatment sequence and a confounder that's also a mediator, you need to use the G methods to get a valid estimate. Um, so thank you for listening. I'm, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Ellie, for that wonderful talk. Um, I'm just going to end the recording here and we will go into the discussion.